Six. The tithe in history. Church historians are usually high-minded people who rarely give attention to such things as money, except, of course, when negotiating for their salaries. As a result, too little attention has been paid to the relationship between giving and reformation. The early church, from references here and there in surviving documents, apparently spoke of the tithe as an obligation. Thus, the apostolic constitutions refer to, quote, the tenths and first fruits, end quote, as, quote, the command of God, end quote, and distinguishes them from, quote, free will offerings, end quote, to 425. The clergy are said to have replaced the priests and Levites. In fact, the regulations were sometimes very specific, as again in the Apostolic Constitutions, which states that all first fruits belong to the bishop, the presbyters, and the deacons for their maintenance, the tithe in its entirety went for the rest of the clergy, for virgins, widows, and the poor. 7. 4. 30. In Cyprian, Augustine, Ambrose, Chrysostom, and others, we find references to tithing. The Council of Tours, 567, declared the tithe to be obligatory. Indifference with respect to tithing led again and again to a decline in the work of the Church. Reforms always went hand in hand with tithing. Repeatedly, when the Church became derelict, other Christian agencies were started, received the tithes of the faithful, and reformed the Church. Throughout the Middle Ages, as well as later, schools, hospitals, orphanages, churches, poor relief, and much more depended entirely on the tithe. It is significant that, during the spiritual ebbs of the medieval era, care of the poor and the sick was still maintained. A decretal of 1200 addressed the Archbishop of Canterbury by Innocent III made mandatory that tithes be paid to the parish church. This step was one of the most destructive of acts in the medieval era, and it made the Reformation inevitable and necessary. Previously, a believer's ability to control his tithe and to pay it to the deserving Christian causes had been instrumental in recurring reforms within the church. By binding the tithe to the parish church, and much later by requiring attendance at the parish church, whatever its character, the self-reforming character of the church was destroyed. Previously, the church was readily subject to reform on the level of the believer by his control of the tithe. Now, only two means of reform remained, first from the top and second by division, as at the Reformation. Where Protestants seek similarly to bind the tithe to the church, the same stifling of reform and growth occurs. With the Reformation, the most notable developments took place within Puritanism. Thomas Lever, in sermons preached in 1550, saw as sacrilege the confiscation by Henry VIII of church properties. That which belongs to the Lord is the Lord's, not man's. His preaching called for and prompted restitution. The result was the beginnings of Puritan tithing and giving, the greatest outpouring of Christian financing in history. We are still living on the remnants of that impetus. W.K. Jordan has written on some of the early aspects of that Puritan giving. In one area of life after another, it provided social financing. The United States witnessed an equally great movement, a continuation of the Puritan one. Alexis de Tocqueville in Democracy in America, 1835, saw, quote, private associations, end quote, as the essential and basic government of the United States. Most private associations were Christian tithe agencies. Christians created a tithe agency to minister to every kind of need, to preach the gospel to people in foreign lands, to immigrants landing in the U.S., to seamen at American ports, and so on. Immigrants were given job training, their wives taught homemaking, and their children placed in Christian schools. As problems arose, new missions were created to minister to them. The United States had serious problems in those days. European prisons were regularly emptied and the prisoners shipped to the U.S. De Tocqueville saw what these people in great numbers meant to America's future, inhabiting as they did its major cities. 
they were creating slums worse than anything Europe knew. He stated, quote, The lower orders which inhabit these U.S. cities constitute a rabble even more formidable than the populace of European towns. They consist of freed blacks in the first place who are condemned by the laws and by public opinion to an hereditary state of misery and degradation. They also contain a multitude of Europeans who have been driven to the shores of the New World by their misfortunes or their misconduct. And these men inoculate the United States with all our vices without bringing with them any of those interests which counteract their baneful influence. As inhabitants of a country where they have no civil rights, they are ready to turn all the passions which agitate the community to their own advantage. Thus, within the last few months, serious riots have broken out in Philadelphia and in New York. Disturbances of this kind are unknown in the rest of the country, which is no wise alarmed by them, because the population of the cities has hitherto exercised neither power nor influence over the rural districts. Nevertheless, I look upon the size of certain American cities, and especially on the nature of their population, as a real danger which threatens the future security of the democratic republics of the New World. And I venture to predict that they will perish from this circumstance unless the government succeed in creating an armed force which, while it remains under the control of the majority of the nation, will be independent of the town population and able to repress its excesses. End quote. No federal army to talk full to the country was necessary to keep the rabble of the U.S. cities from destroying the country. Another army took care of the situation, a Christian legion of tithe-supported workers who converted the slum dwellers into saints of the Lord and useful citizens. In England, General William Booth, and then in America and elsewhere, led the way into the slums. In his book, In Darkest England and the Way Out, Booth charted a plan for the redemption of the total lives of slum dwellers with the gospel, job training and everything else needful for their godly functioning in society. Booth, in these areas, was an heir of the Puritans. One of his most vicious critics, it should be noted, was the evolutionist Huxley. The failure of quote-unquote Christians to tithe, their dereliction from the faith and from God's law, leaves us today with cities in which not only the slum dwellers, but the rich are a menace with their lawlessness. In the countryside, the absence of faith is again responsible for moral decline and waywardness. Nothing effectual about any of these problems can be done apart from God's law. The principle of restitution must be restored to criminal law. The family must again assume the basic responsibilities of government. Schools must be Christian or else they will be anti-Christian. And God's tithe must be paid or God's work in God's way will not be done. We are reaping the harvest of man's work, of our own work, of humanism in our lives. God's harvest comes only in God's appointed way.